you so much for coming out. The debate is nothing without all of you here. The first thing I want to say besides thanks for coming out is to tell you just a word about the Leeds Civic Association. You know, the, we're sponsoring this event and we are so glad that those of you from the rest of Ward 7 have come to join us. Um, some of you are aware, and some of you may not be, that the Civic Association is not a political organization. It's an organization that fosters good times in the neighborhood, that uh, sponsors parties and cleanups, welcomes new people, and is very decidedly not partisan. We're not Democrat, we're not Republican, we don't take stands in favor of any particular candidate or party, and I understand that someone who had access to our email list sent some of you an invitation to an event for one of the candidates that was not a Leeds Civic Association authorized use, and I apologize because we do not share your names with political parties, we do not share your names with businesses, it's our own organization. We get together because we like each other. If we all had the same opinion, they wouldn't need all of us. It's all these different opinions that make it such a wonderful community. So thank you for excusing that uh, misuse of our, of our mailing list, and we apologize for it. The good news is that we have two candidates who are willing to stand up, not only to let us ask them questions, but to then put in the hard work to represent us in the city council. There are far worse problems than having two people who let us have a difficult choice in who we're going to vote for on the 5th. So thanks to both to Jean and Elisa for coming along and letting us ask them questions. Thanks to all of you who sent in questions ahead of time. We will be, ask, I will be asking those questions. A number of questions were on similar topics, so I've kind of put them together. And we will save some time at the end so that if the question that's burning in your heart doesn't get addressed, you'll have a chance to come up and ask it. We ask that you do not clap or boo or cheer during either of the speeches or when people are speaking from the floor. This is a chance for us all to learn. And thankfully, um, this isn't a presidential debate where people are so rude to each other. This is a neighborhood where we enjoy each other and we respect each other even when we disagree. So let me tell you, um, I'm, we're going to be going every other one. We drew straws, and Elisa decided to go first, so she will go first throughout the whole evening, giving Jean the last word. So I'm going to introduce Jean first, and then I'll introduce Elisa, who will be speaking first. So I asked them all several questions about each of them, about what they might want you to know about them. And the first one is just, how long have you lived here? Jean's answer was, since 1873. <laughs> now you do the math. You know, he's lived in Florence for 57 years, so you can figure that out. Um, many of you probably know that he's self-employed. He uh, has an excavation business as a contractor. And if you, um, you know, I have seen rocks. He has moved. I'm not kidding you. This guy's a heavy lifter. <laughs> He's a US uh, Navy, Navy vet. He served during the Vietnam War. He's been a city councilor for four years and has the emails and the phone messages to prove it. He's, uh, before that, he spent 30 years going to civic meetings, school board meetings, city council meetings, 
And after listening and giving his opinion for so many years, he decided it was time to step up to the plate and take his turn at what's really a pretty tough job. But you know, he's not all about muscle and moving big, heavy stones and running big, heavy machinery. Would you have guessed he's an opera freak? Yeah, he is. He's a big fan of, of uh, Joaquino Rossini. He loves Gerard Butler, Pavarotti, and Paul Potts. Had you ever heard of Paul Potts? That was a new one. I mean, we've all heard of pa Pavarotti, but Paul, Paul Potts? I had to look him up on YouTube and listen to him. Let me tell you, it's worth it. I had tears in my eyes. So this is a guy that lifts big rocks and listens to amazing music. So over here we have Elisa, who has lived here in Ward 7 and in Leeds for 14 years, first as a renter in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, and then 10 years as a homeowner. She liked it so much here, she and her husband, that they moved, she and her partner, that they moved here after years as renting and bought a house here in 2003. So altogether, 20 years in Northampton. She also is a small business owner. She owns and operates a consulting business where she helps organizations that work on social justice, interpersonal violence prevention, and peace building. She's worked with the people with disabilities at Stavros, She's uh, worked with people with HIV and AIDS, uh, with the Visiting Nurses Association, and has helped organizations be more effective um, for the prevention of violence and the promotion of peace and human rights. And her civic work in, in our area, she's worked through the Leeds Civic Association, through neighborhood cleanups, bicycle rides, and of course, the parties. That's what, that's what Leeds is, is famous for, right? She's been on the advisory boards and boards of directors of a number of local community-based organizations, Valley Free Radio, Voices from Inside, Western Mass American Friends Service. She's a volunteer and the mediator for the Northampton District Court and does some uh, programming and DJing on the Valley Free Radio. She's done some canvassing for Shelter Sunday and helps to uh, make bags for the Bag Share Project, keeping bags out of the local waste stream. And she serves on a number of similar boards at the national level. And that all sounds like the kind of work you do sitting down in a chair, right? She has some surprises too. This woman wants jumped off a 35-foot waterfall into the pool below. So we, don't, we may think we know these neighbors of ours, but there are some things that are kind of surprising about both of them. So the first question that we're going to move into right after, I'll give Elisa a chance to, to go and just tell you about herself and why she wants to be on the city council. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you to the Lead Civic Association uh, for holding this event and to Penny for moderating. And thank you all for coming. I'm glad that you care enough about Ward 7 to give up a little bit of the uh, World Series. So that's very much appreciated. I live on Chestnut Avenue in Leeds, and I've owned my home there since 2003. Uh, interestingly, and Penny uh, referred to this, I was a renter for several years in the same house that I now own um, when I came here first in 1988. And it's testimony to how much I love Leeds, and when I moved back to the area after grad school, I bought a house here. I love Northampton, and I'm dedicated to the community, build, to community building in Ward 7's neighborhoods. In my professional life, I operate Elisa Klein Consulting. 
I help local and national organizations to analyze and influence the public policy that relates to their work. I assist organizations to develop strategic plans to grow their organizations and increase their influence within the fields that they work. And I specialize in the fields of violence prevention and peace building, as Penny said. I'm a trained mediator, and I use these skills to foster collaboration amongst groups of people who uh, differ on particular issues. As the city councilor for Ward 7, I will listen to and faithfully represent all of the residents of our neighborhoods. I'll be accessible and I'll respond to your concerns. I'll hold regular town meeting style gatherings for us to discuss issues. I'll share regular updates about what's being discussed in city council. And I'll be available, available to you by phone and email and I'll hold regular office hours so you can find me with ease. As the city councilor for Ward 7, I'm committed to scrutinizing Northampton's budget. I'm a small business owner, and I have to balance my own books and grow revenue, so I'll bring these skills to Northampton city government. I know we can't continue to rely on overrides to keep our city financially stable. Our fiscal struggles stem from an almost 50% drop in federal and state aid over the last decade. In response, I will work collaboratively with other elected officials from around Western Massachusetts to get back to Northampton more of our tax dollars. I'll find ways to cut costs and increase revenue through the implementation of energy efficiency measures and regionalization of city services, regional purchasing of materials and resources, reimbursement for services delivered to other municipalities. Other areas that I'm dedicated to working on keeping our schools strong, promoting sustainable, alternative energy-based and green practices throughout the city, traffic calming throughout Ward 7 on Bridge Road, for instance, um, on the roads that surround the new Florence fields. And I want to expand the role of Florence and Leeds in Northampton's vibrant arts community. I will support the growth of local businesses and local farms. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everybody, um, and thank you to the Leeds Civic Association and Penny. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Gene Tacey, and I have been honored to have served you on the Northampton City Council for the last two terms. I am humbled by your presence, and I have, been, I have been married for almost 30 years to my wife and best friend, Peg, and I have a son 20 years old. His name is Christopher. I'm an extremely proud U.S. Navy Vietnam era veteran. I don't want anybody to walk away from here thinking I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm a Vietnam era veteran, which only means that I had served in the military in the area during the time of Vietnam. And I'm a veteran of the conflict against the forces of Idi Amin in the African theater. And I'm the only veteran's voice on the city's council. I'm a self-employed and I'm a lifelong resident of Ward 7, ward seven giving me a sense of ever-changing needs of the ward, a real sense. This ward changes continuously. All are welcome. And the most important thing of all is that all can afford to live here. As I have strived and fought like heck to see that the investment that you make in this community with your hard-earned tax dollars gets spent in the most effective way possible, and as a member of the Finance Committee, I strive to see that that happens. I brought a whole new dynamic to the City Council in 2010 as being one who asked tough questions and was not there to rub elbows and make nice, but rather to represent the ward with zeal. Before taking office, I had taken a look at many aspects of the city and its functions and found areas that I thought needed a closer look. My continued research uncovered a multitude of things that had to be addressed. Under the former mayor, and one being a rampant waste of tax dollars and public funds in the parking department and receipts reserved for appropriation, I uncovered the misappropriation of a $140,000 bucket loader, which was sent back to the dealer. I brought my research to the attention of our current mayor, which he continued, resulting in the removal of the parking director and the elimination of the position and also the position of the executive secretary. Unwarranted overtime, comp time under the former mayor, this research in my airing at city council has resulted in an entirely new comp time policy set by this mayor. These are not nickels and dimes, these are real dollars, they're your dollars. When the former mayor eliminated the $400 line item for the Committee on Disabilities, I was the one who noticed that this in the budget and went to work with my municipal finance and taxation law books and found a way to fund 
found a way to fund the item with thousands of dollars from handicapped parking violations, allowing the Committee on Disabilities to fund such things as braille menus for local eateries and a multitude of things that are vital to our most vulnerable population. I am very proud of my chairmanship of the Bean Allard Task Force, a project which promotes food security, preservation of farmland, open space, and also provides playing fields for our youth, where they will be able to hone competitiveness and people skills. This collaboration of all areas has helped to provide for middle ground for all walks of life in this city and will be a place for all to gather and get to know one another. Three minutes is not enough time to list all my accomplishments on this council. It is in the best interest of this city that we all work together and provide a stable, affordable place to live for generations to come, because that is our job. Thank you. So the first, we are going to hear a group of questions that have to do with infrastructure people's concerns about various, you know, I've consolidated a number of concerns that people have about the road situations here in our neighborhoods. Uh, I'm gonna, s somebody here will recognize different parts of this. Have you driven on Audubon Road? Have you driven on Lower Main? Have you driven on the two Main Street bridges and Sylvester Road? The condition of these roads is without exaggeration deplorable and unsafe due to potholes, irregular surface, and the many temporary asphalt cold patches. We're glad that Kennedy Street is getting worked on, but we are still concerned about the, particularly the safety of bicyclists. Some of these roads are state-designated bicycle uh, roadways. In addition, there is some concern about the safety of bicyclists crossing the new traffic circle, although that was controversial when it, uh, when it was um, proposed. Most people seem to think it improves the traffic flow, but there's still concern about the safety of pedestrians and uh, bicyclists. And finally, if you would name three streets you think are the highest priority for paving. And what would you do to see that these things are addressed and how soon do you think it might be possible? Yes. Because I'm asking them to jump up and down because Northampton Cable Television is kindly recording this and this will make sure that when you go home, when you tell your friends and neighbors they should watch, they'll be able to hear it. Lot of shuffling back and forth. Um, I, uh, I've spoken at length to folks at the Department of Public Works, uh, particularly Ned Huntley, who explained to me the uh, formula for determining which streets, ranking which streets need to be paved when. You know, I really value um, the city's kind of laying out of how this is done in a very logical way. There's a measurement of potholes and they're ranked in order of when they need attention. Um, part of the problem is, is that we're not receiving the chapter 90 funds that we should from the state. This is part of the problem that I mentioned in my opening, um, that we have lost almost 50% of our state aid um, from the state, and that includes the chapter 90 funds that oversee that are, are used for things like paving roads, filling potholes. Um, so Northampton, like many cities and uh, towns in, in Massachusetts, is really um, fighting against this lack of funds to take care of our roads. Um, I know that Chesterfield Road is currently being paved as we speak. That was kind of the number one uh, street on my list that really needed care. Audubon Road right there with it. I know that part of Audubon Road, the, the most troubled part of Audubon Road is being paved as we speak, so I'm glad that that's happening and being taken care of. I think we have problems on uh, Cordicelli Street. I hear from residents when I go door knocking that they're really concerned about uh, the need for paving there. And um, I want to get to all of what you asked about. 
uh, the, the roundabout, um, I think it does need to be revisited. Now that we've been using it for a couple of years, we really need to be looking at safety for pedestrians and for cyclists um, and look at possibly pushing back the, the crossroads, the, um, the, the places where people cross to uh, ensure more safety. Thanks. Well, but he will get the full time and then she can rebut it if she has a problem with it. Could you tell I hated reading that first statement? Um, but anyway, uh, we had uh, looked at several roads in the city of Northampton. The Board of Public Works has uh, a pavement maintenance program that assesses the needs for street repair by a percentage of what they figure the life is left in the street. And they do it as 10 or 15 or 20 percent. And when a road gets to 85 percent uh, where it's been used up, then it's time to regrind it and reconstruct it. They try to do that earlier than that. They do a lot of pavement maintenance. They do things such as crack sealing, things such as that, which really works. And it saves us an enormous amount of money. It makes the road last that much longer. But uh, Kennedy Road was going to be done with what they call the rubberized chip seal. And anyway, I had taken a trip to New Hampshire to see them doing a rubberized chip seal roadway. It's very fast, very quick, but it's not conducive to bicyclists because if you fell on that, you would stick to it. I mean, it's thick rocks, it's very sharp, and it, it just was, it was not going to work out as far as I was concerned. But we were fortunate enough to have the contractor come and tell us that, I'm on the conference committee at the Board of Public Works, that uh, this road was too far gone for rubberized chip seal. It was a $360,000 contract. So we scrapped that, and Ned Huntley, through different areas and different grants and different pools of money he was able to pull together, we're going to spend $900,000 on Kennedy Road right now. It's actually in, in the process of being ground, and it's going to be repaved. I'm working with Peter Colcott right now for another million dollars to do all of Autobahn Road. Um, we're going to do uh, Kennedy Road right from the bridge all the way to the Williamsburg line, uh, except for that... 50 feet of no man's land that nobody's been able to figure out who owns yet, Williamsburg or, or Northampton. Um, and it's difficult. The Chapter 90 funds are cut every single year. We keep losing more and more and more. Uh, as far as the pedestrians and the bikes and things in the roundabout, I chair the Transportation and Parking Commission, and we are now working on that. So we're, we, are, we are looking at uh, pedestrian safety in the roundabout. I think I um, just misspoke out of nervousness. I uh, meant uh, Kennedy Road, not Chesterfield Road. Did I say Chesterfield Road? Mm -hmm. I did. I'm sorry. I meant Kennedy Road. Um, first of all, I understand, um, Jean, that you are the vice chair of that committee, correct? Yeah. Um, and I also uh, think that we really need to be relying on DPW's um, its ranking. We also have a new system in Northampton that called the C-Click system, which allows people to call in with their problems and complaints about potholes. I think that's a, a really reliable way for us to uh, get out there and gather the information that we need about the potholes and make sure that they're filled. And uh, thank you to Jean for reminding me that uh, there are in fact different different uh, levels of repair for roads that cost different amounts based on how serious the condition is. Um, I think that Northampton is doing a really good job at, at kind of ranking those different problems. Thanks. So this time, Jean will get to go first. A number of people are concerned about money. Gee, maybe we're all concerned about money. And someone says, you know, after the override, we, the family, we cut our cable costs to the bare minimum. We cut our weekly eat out. And we don't mind making these kind of sacrifices and cutbacks. But shouldn't the city follow similar fiscal restraints? Where do you see opportunities for such cuts? Do you understand this? How will you balance the budget without another override? And a similar question is asking, how will you attract new business to expand the tax base so that we will have additional funds without an override? I 
think I've scrutinized the Northampton City's budget as well as anybody, and I think I probably know it um, as well as most anybody, uh, with the exception of possibly Susan Wright, who is absolutely wonderful. Um, I got into looking at different things, uh, comp time, overtime. I got into uh, taking vehicles home at night. Uh, some go to Belchertown, some go out far as West Hampton. We have three that go to West Hampton out of a single department. We have, uh, I think there's some 60 or so vehicles that go home um, at night. It's a tremendous amount. I mean, that, that, that should stop. I mean, if you go to your job, nobody gives you a vehicle. You go to your job, you drive your car there, and then you take your city vehicle and whatever, cut down on the wear and tear. You don't, you're not replacing these vehicles so often. Um, there's, uh, when I asked Chris Pyle how we budget for comp time, he said, we don't budget for comp time because it's budget neutral. And it struck me as odd, and I said, well, somebody's not paying attention here because it's not budget neutral because if somebody's on comp time, somebody is filling in your, your spot. So it costs money comp time. Uh, so, and if you can have three or four people out on comp time in a five-person department, and then there's only two people running the department, then couldn't two people run the department? I mean, it just, it gets, it gets odd. It gets, it, it gets funny. It's very complicated, too. It's not the easiest thing in the world to figure out. Um, uh, fuel use and such as that. Uh, how much time are we spending in vehicles and riding around with fuel? Now, fuel is $4 a gallon, diesel fuel, uh, things such as that. There's so many ways, I think, that if we paid attention to just exactly what we were doing, and I think department heads need to take a closer look, but they're busy. They are extremely busy in what they're doing. Um, I have uh, talked to the congressman and our senator and our representative, and I've hammered them about this grant money. I would like sure as heck for them to stop the issuance of all of this grant money and give us this money with no strings attached as unrestricted local aid. And there's a huge, there's a beautiful answer to that question, but I can't go. He's telling me to stop. You can get another minute later. Um, I have been door knocking quite a bit and talking to folks, and I do hear consistently that uh, people feel like they can't, they can't continue to live here. They're being priced out of Northampton with um, increased taxes, the override that we just passed, and I'm concerned about that. I know that that's a real issue, especially in Ward 7. Um, I, I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier that we, over the last decade in Northampton, as most cities in Massachusetts have, have lost almost 50% of our state and federal funding. This is what's really creating the crunch in our city. This is what's really creating a situation whereby we have to do things like pass overrides. I want to work collaboratively um, with elected officials from the entire region to have more of a presence in the State House for Western Massachusetts and to um, reassess and re figure out how to create these formulas so that we can get more of our tax dollars back to Northampton. I think that, that we need that kind of really foundational policy change to ensure that we have the amount of money we need to keep our schools strong and growing, to keep the arts strong and growing in Northampton, all of our programs, public safety, um, first responders, all of that can be strengthened by getting back more of our tax dollars from the, from the, uh, the state and from the feds. Um, I'm also interested, as I mentioned before, in looking at regionalization of services. I think that with all the small towns and cities in this area, there's a lot of opportunity for us to not just uh, save money by procuring things uh, jointly with towns and cities around here, but also being reimbursed for the services that we provide to them. We do some of that already, but I think we can enhance that. Um, I also think that we can use sustainable means and uh, really responsible waste disposal to uh, lower the costs and to actually get back money using sustainable methods. Thanks. Back into the budget part. <clears throat> the planning department takes in 10 times the amount of money that it costs to run the entire planning department in the form of grants for different things. All grants come in with strings attached, and that's where you have to use them. I, if you, 6-6-2013, the, the city council meeting, I went off on the council along with uh, representatives and senators and congressmen about knocking off all of the grant money 
passing this money, it could be $4 million a year to the city of Northampton as unrestricted local aid. We could fund our roads, we could fund our schools, we could fund our whatever it was we wanted. We have already regionalized nearly everything that we can, including our public health nurses, including uh, we're looking at dispatch at this point for public uh, safety. We have regionalized our, our veteran services. Um, and that list goes on. We have been regionalizing uh, whatever we could in the city of Northampton for about five or so years now. And it, the, real, the push is on now. Renewable energy is also um, huge. We actually have National Grid, who is utilizing the city of Northampton now as a model. And they are coming here to tell us about uh, resilient energy and how we can uh, get through um, uh, affordable and re reusable energy. They loved us when they looked at us, and so now we are working with them, and that will be a huge uh, money saver for the city. Following the Roundup controversy at Florence Fields, the Recreation and Public Works Departments have met with land care specialists in other Massachusetts cities who use organic turf management practices already. Do you think the city should adopt organic management methods for city-owned lands? And what would you do to promote the policies you favor? You go first this time. If you went first last time, you go first. All right. Okay. I got thrown off there. Um, I, uh, there are precedents of towns and cities in Massachusetts that are using organic turf management uh, practices. Uh, the city of Newton and the city of Marblehead are two examples in Massachusetts. And I know that uh, DPW and the Recreation Department have both contracted with uh, folks from Marblehead to come and do some training. I think we are, as a city, moving in the direction of uh, really exploring the possibility of using organic turf management or integrated pest management, uh, management which is, in fact, uh, just kind of lowering the amount of pesticides that we use. I do feel strongly that that's something that we need to be looking at. And I think that right here in Ward 7, we have the test ground, the test case for looking at um, organic management because we have Florence Fields, which sits uh, adjacent to three parcels of land that are organic, are, are going to be organic if they're not yet certified organic. The community gardens, the organic community gardens that grow food Northampton set up, the uh, Crimson and Clover Farm, and there's a private farm um, adjacent on Meadow Street that is also organic. So we have a real need to um, think about the use of organic uh, products. And I think that a lot of people have been talking about the, the cost of these chemicals, or these non-chemicals, the organic products, um, and that it makes it prohibitive. prohibitive. I think that as, um, as a city and as a society, we be, need to be thinking long term about the consequences of the use of heavy pesticides. And I think we have to figure that into the actual costs to the city. Um, if we're making our children sick, if we are killing off the bee population, the bird population, those are all costs as well. And we have to be thinking about how we can uh, manage those costs when we think about organic versus uh, chemical-based management. When the issue first came up about the Florence Fields, I read 800 pages of Roundup. I read every study that was ever done on it. And I, you have to take into consideration what it was going to cost, like uh, um, uh, Alicia said. It was very, very expensive to try and build this organically. It wasn't going to work out. Roundup is a class four, which is uh, minimal hazard to wildlife and uh, water. So. The decision was made to use the Roundup to enhance uh, the field, the, the quick grow, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there were, in my research, two people died from Roundup. Both of them ingested it. They drank eight ounces of it. So anyway, so it's hard. You know, you really have to weed through all of it. I get it, weed through it. But anyway, uh, the whole site in any farmland in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is covered with chemicals. That whole site has got DDT. It's got copper, it's got cambium, you name it, 
uh, it's there. Roundup, I, I look at as pretty damn near inert. Um, it has a very, very, it has a very short shelf life. It doesn't last long. It sticks. Uh, it doesn't run off. Um, and it was a big decision, and the mayor made the decision, uh, and and I and I stuck by him on that decision. Um, it cut the cost of the construction of the field, the landscaping part of it, by almost two thirds. Um, so. Uh, I, I didn't see anything. There were no red flags. Nothing was jumping all over me that said the use of Roundup was going to harm anybody. Um, we we're going to have kids on the field, things such as that. If I thought for a minute that this particular product would harm kids, I've had kids on all those fields all over the city, uh, I would never have used it. But I felt safe using it. I looked at the research and not just the manufacturers, independent laboratories. So, thank you. Um, I, I just want us to think about the fact that we are, not only are our children playing on these fields, but we are um, going to games and we're having picnics on these, on the grass at the fields where our babies are crawling around on these fields. Um, Roundup, in fact, I don't know what research, Gene, you've been looking at, but the extensive research that I've done really tells us that Roundup, in fact, has enormous uh, harmful uh, outcomes. I think there are long-term outcomes to Roundup. I, I've read uh, studies that talk about increased infertility um, and all kinds of other health issues associated with Roundup. Um, so I, I would just kind of rebut that uh, it's not accurate that Roundup is safe. And I do think that we have to, you know, slowly and with care, um, really look into finding alternative ways to manage all of the, the green spaces in our city. And this, uh, I have a number of qu other questions, but I'm only going to use one more, and then we're going to open it up and give you a chance to come to the mic and ask your own questions in your own way. So the final question that I am going to ask now is what is the single most important issue facing Northampton in the next two years? And what specifically do you plan to do to solve it? How would your presence on the city council improve the current state of our city government? I think by far and away the most important issue coming before uh, the city of Northampton right now is the stormwater management. We're looking at nearly $100 million worth of repair work to do throughout the entire system. Now, for 50 some odd or 60 some odd years, we have, uh, we're calling it deferred maintenance. Many call it neglect. Use whatever term you want. But for 50 years, we haven't done anything with our storm system. It has fallen apart. Now, we're going to ask the taxpayers to pay into a stormwater enterprise fund. And we're going to look, there's a $2 million budget attached to it right now. So after an override and every other thing that's coming up, along with uh, possibly 12 or 15 percent rise in our water and sewer bills uh, next year, uh, if I'm going to get hit in the side of the head with a brick, I want it to be a small brick and I want it to come slowly. So I'm going to propose half that budget. If we're using $400,000 right now out of the city's funds to fund the repairs on the stormwater currently, then if we put another million dollars into that, then we have more than tripled the amount of money that we're spending on it. And as Jim Dostal and I were talking, we'll try that. We'd like to try that for a period of five years and then revisit it and see if that money is enough rather than just throwing $2 million at something, a, a number that has just been picked out of the air, uh, it's a proposed budget. Uh, I, would, I, I would much rather spend half that money and try it out and see what happens in the short term. Five years from now, if we feel that that's not enough money, because it's happened in the state already in three other cities, they had picked a budget and it turned out to be possibly not enough money, so they revisit it and they step it up a little bit. But I would much rather pay $40 a year than 80 
on top of an override, on top of the CPA, on top of 10 or 15 percent uh, more water bill. Uh, the costs keep incurring, and people need to be able to afford to live here. And that is my big concern. Well, I do. We've already spoken about uh, this, both Gene and I, a number of times this evening. But I do think that uh, fiscal, uh, financial stabilization for Northampton is really what we are needing to um, address in the coming two years as the central issue. Um, I've already spoken to the some of the different things that I think need to be done. Um, I, I think the most important piece is getting back more of our tax dollars to the city so that we can uh, stabilize things and that we can, beyond just stabilize uh, our schools and our public safety infrastructure, we can actually grow these things. Um, I do think that uh, the stormwater uh, and flood control uh, utility that's being proposed is going to be a hard thing for people because it's another payment that they will have to make. I think it's an unfunded ma mandate from the federal government and Northampton does have to find a way to make sure that our city is safe, that we won't uh, be flooded. We are lucky enough to live in a place that has the Connecticut River and the Mill River, um, amazing features of our city, but they do put us at risk and we're going to have to uh, design a system and infrastructure that will shore up all of the uh, the dams that we have in place, the dikes that we have in place that were built in the 1930s and have not, as Jean said, they have not received the maintenance that they've needed. Um, I don't think the $2 million number was pulled out of thin air. I think that there was uh, a very, an extraordinarily well done study by an a ad hoc committee that was appointed. Um, and we do have to find ways to fund uh, that $2 million piece of work on all of our dams. Um, I do think that one of the things we can look at for individuals and families in terms of uh, the utility, the amount of money they'll pay towards uh, that fund is to create credits so that people can work at their homes to insta install things like dry wells, uh, water catchment barrels. There are all kinds of ways that individuals can get credits and lower uh, the amount of money that they will need to, uh, to put out towards this enterprise. The things that you can do to lower the amount of money that you put into the Stormwater Enterprise Fund are very, very expensive things to do. Installing dry wells, excavating, pipes, stone. So you could probably pay 50 years worth of a stormwater enterprise fee for maybe what it would cost you to install those dry wells. Uh, so don't forget, it's a mandate only because we were told it was a mandate. But across the nation right now, States are finding that the DEP and the EPA has no authority to regulate stormwater. So the mandate part is coming out of the equation. I've discussed this with uh, Ned Huntley, Stan Rosenberg, and Pete Colcutt. It is coming out of the formula. So, and none of it is etched in stone yet. So I do believe that we should start off with a small number and take it from there. Three times as much as we're spending right now, I think, is enough money to get started and figure out where we're going. Uh, buy a little less equipment. I stopped. <laughs> and now it's your turn. Who would like to be first? Come, come to the microphone in the center here. I know some of you have questions, so uh, don't be shy. Okay. Come on, come on over to the mic. I'm John Field from Florence, and my question really is the part of the last question that wasn't answered, uh, which is what you personally, yourself, can do to accomplish what you think are uh, the important or is the important task facing the city. What you can do as a member of the city council within the authority that you will have as part of a group of people to bring about a successful conclusion to what you consider to be the problem. Talk about yourself. 
So those of you in the back, could you hear that question clearly? Okay. Well, I won't repeat it then. I'll let you just get started. So you go first this time. Thank you for pressing that point. I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I am really committed to uh, bringing about sustainable means of um, managing our city. I think it, it, it's the right thing to do for the environment, but it's also a way to bring us to savings in the city and to creating revenue streams for the city. I think that a solar array on the capped, uh, it's being capped as we speak, the landfill that was closed, is something that um, I want to work towards and I think that being part of the sustainability committee for city council, um, I will have the purview to really push that and shape it and uh, move it forward. Um, East Hampton currently has a 2.2 megawatt system on 12 acres of a capped landfill. We have about 19 acres, we have 52 acres there, but 19 acres that are south facing where we can put a solar array that can bring in an enormous amount of energy, power all of our municipal buildings, and also give us income when we sell back to the grid the energy that we pull from it. It's something I'm very committed to and something that I know on city council I'll be able to work towards. We've been working on solar on the landfill for about five years now, and it's going to happen. It's not going to happen right away because the landfill isn't capped yet, and it's going to require time for it to settle before we can put anything on it. But what we can do, and I'm working on right now with uh, central services, we can't put solar arrays on city buildings because it costs too much money because we don't get a tax break because they're nonprofit. So there is no tax break. But what we can do is we can sell the space or lease the space to these power uh, companies that will build the solar array themselves and they will get the tax break and they will give that to us in the form of a revenue stream. We will collect from them the space that they lease, they will collect on the power. So we're working on that. Um, it's been going on for quite some time. We have a number of buildings where we can put solar, mass solar, Let's face it, uh, they could put this stuff on our city buildings and we could power our buildings. Right now, with the power that we have at the Smith School, we, and their old tennis court, which they weren't using anymore, we now have a solar array out there, we're providing 21% of the power it takes to run Smith School from that solar array. So, they're big numbers, they're, they're real dollars, it's, it's a lot of money, uh, and battery backups and things such as that, uh, to run City Hall, things like that. Um, we're looking at solar arrays for when we lose power, for power resilience. Um, there's a number of things that we're doing. Chris Mason, uh, his nose is in it all day long, 40 hours a week for central services. Um, he's a great guy. We do all of these things, but we don't do all of these things ourselves as counselors. We have committees and committees and committees. You can't do it because our last city council meeting, not this past one, was four pages. We were there till midnight. So you really can't do everything that you'd like to do because you have to do the business of the council and you have to rely on the committees and the people that you, that you bring around you to make all of this stuff work. Jean, I'm glad to hear that you agree that a solar array and uh, sustainable measures are what we need for the city. Um, I just, uh, I'm not sure that I've seen you actually do any of those things, be responsible for moving them forward. Um, I'm committed to it. I have um, a pretty vast knowledge of how these things are done, all of the different uh, resources that we can access to do it all of the um, state and federal grants that we can access to put things in place. Um, and that's what I uh, would like to do and really to be one of the, the main pieces of work that I do on city council. There are more, I know there are more questions. Uh, my name is Bud Stockwell, 
And uh, while you're both vying for the position of the Ward 7 Councilor, it's also you're going to be sitting voting on issues that pertain to the whole city. Uh, this summer there was a, a resolution for vibrant sidewalks which talked about um, the positiveness of having disruptive uh, confrontational events taking place and encouraging that uh, and it was voted in seven to two be, you know, be, they didn't have the second hearing yet um, I guess my question is if, if this came up again, would you be voting to support something where uh, the city is advocating this disruptive activity as being good for the downtown? Everybody hear that okay? Yeah. I voted no. The language in the vibrant sidewalks says it will promote the violation of the social norm. And it will promote disruptive behavior that may be deemed as uncomfortable to some. So disruptive and violate the social norm. The social norm is you wear clothes outside in downtown Northampton. You poop in a bathroom. You don't pee on the street. You don't sleep in the middle of the sidewalk. That is a violation of the social. Brattleboro did this, by the way. And they finally got rid of it about two weeks ago. It was awful. You tie the hands of the police department. How in the heck is the police department going to know what the heck any more disorderly conduct is? If the city council passes an ordinance that says, you can be disruptive and you can violate the social norm. You can be loud. It was, the, the language was awful. The language just was a real can of worms for me. It has been tabled indefinitely, by the way. It never came back up for the second vote. And I'm not sure that it will, um, unless, unless there's some severe language changes to it. it uh, I mean, and this all stemmed from the removal of six of the 26 benches downtown. That's where all this came from. Uh, I was on board with it when the mayor did it. It was an experiment to see how it was going to work. But immediately downtown got to up in arms. And so politics wielded its ugly head. And local politicians that were working in the downtown district Went to the mayor, and Howard, and next thing you know, all the benches are going back in. Never even had a chance to finish the experiment. It was not a permanent removal of benches, but the vibrant sidewalks, I want people to respect the social norm. Um, the experiment of uh, removing the benches, uh, I think, um, failed. I think uh, within 24 to 48 hours after um, after the benches were removed, there was an enormous outcry, both within the city council and from citizens, um, and they were put back. I think that the spirit behind the Vibrant Sidewalks resolution was um, strong and valid and important. I think there are civil liberties issues about uh, people being able to be on our sidewalks in a, n a number of ways. I do think that the language of the resolution needed some amending. I think that uh, had I been on the city council and voting on that, I would have asked for, uh, to revisit that, that the specific words. I mean, there was only one piece of it that I think was problematic, and that was that uh, discussion of friction and um, I think with, with a certain amount of rewording, I think the spirit behind it was strong and important and I would have supported it. Um, I do know at the same time that we have to really consider the interests of the business people in downtown, the stores and the shops. I think we have to figure out how to come to a reasonable kind of compromise so that 
business owners downtown feel comfortable, feel like people want to come downtown, come to their stores, but at the same time, we do have to support a vibrant, uh, diverse bunch of people downtown, people who are homeless, people who don't have places to lay down during the day, all kinds of things. We have to think creatively about how to accommodate all of those people at the same time that we're accommodating and meeting the needs of business owners in downtown <laughs> Northampton. One of the ways to accommodate the people during the day is don't close the shelters. The shelter opens up at dark and in the morning they throw them all out. So there's got to be some place, there has to be something put together that will help the shelters stay open all day long. People can be in, they can sleep, they can go as they please, but there has to be some place besides benches on Main Street in Northampton for people to sleep or sidewalks. So somewhere along the line Language has got to be changed in this, uh, and I don't know, uh, we, wrote, we wrote it two or three times, it's been amended a couple of times, and it was actually written by a woman who is an urban planner, and she talked about urban or vibrant sidewalks, and then we tried to find her, and we tried to find something that she had done or was responsible for doing with vibrant sidewalks, and half the city council, like, we couldn't find anything. We could not find any project that she had done uh, so, we took it with a grain of salt, we tabled it. There's a lot more research to do on vibrant sidewalks before we pass that. My name is Deb Jacobs and I live down in the street on Grove Ave. I'm uh, concerned about the budget. I'm concerned about being able to stay in my home like many other people once I retire. But I'm also um, leery of some of the suggestions I've heard to save money. And I'm particularly interested in your take on uh, Smith Vocational being put in with Northampton High School. I personally feel that the Vogue School is a real treasure and they've worked very hard and I'm suspect that it's apples and oranges, and I'd like to know what you think about that. Thank you. That's, um, I know, a tender issue for many people, uh, kind of collapsing Smith Volk into the uh, public school, the Northampton public school system. I. Um, I think that it's something that we're going to need to have a number of town meetings about as a city. We're going to have to listen to um, people who can really uh, analyze what the cost savings would be, but also what the co what this, the uh, cost would be to our city if we um, take away the unique nature of that school by uh, moving it kind of into the rest of the public school system. I think that the intent behind bringing the two schools together, the, the school system and the school together, is to save money, um, but I think we have to think about the ramifications of doing that in other ways. What does that mean for the quality of the education at Smith Folk? Um, how would it be affected? So I think before I were to make you know, an ironclad statement or decision about it, I would want to ask a number of questions. I would want the people from throughout the city to weigh in. I'd like to hear uh, residents' voices, residents of the city's voices. I'd like to hear from the school system. I'd like to hear from Smith Volk. I think that this, because it is such a kind of sensitive issue, a lot of people are invested in the unique nature of Smith Volk. I would want there to be a series of kind of exploratory uh, discussions about that, community meetings, that kind of thing. I'm really into this Smith Volk thing. This could take me an hour, if you don't mind. Red Sox can wait, right? But Smith Volk. People have been driving by Smith Volk, residents of the city of Northampton, and they drive by it and they take it for granted. They drive by it, that's Smith Volk. There are some huge success stories that have come out of Smith Volk. Enormous success stories. My godfather got a certificate of achievement in 1942, 
He went on to head the welding department for the Pratt Whitney Aircraft uh, Corporation in Hartford. Uh, he had a six-figure job in 1967. And there's, that, that's not just one. I mean, there's a bunch of these stories. If you're going to do something with Smith Volk, you have to make sure that it's not going to affect the students. It cannot affect the students. The Department of Education, along with the Department of Revenue, are actually the catalyst behind this. It's not the mayor or whoever, but he's under a lot of pressure. Uh, when we spend the same amount of money on a superintendent for 300 students that we spend for the superintendent North Public School for 3,000 students, it looks funny. The Department of Revenue looks at everything, along with the finance director for a $4.8 million budget at Smith and our finance director for the city of Northampton for a hundred million dollar budget and uh, the pay for the two positions is the same. So somewhere along the line something's going to happen. There's going to have to be a compromise between the city and Smith. I mean it's not we can't have this end up like like Congress. Uh, nobody wanting to give or take but it's going to have to be a compromise between Smith and the city. I can see this coming because the state will not allow this to go on forever. And they have. It's unique. It's the only one. It's the only one in the state. We have a, a candidate for the trustees here. Uh, John Linz was a teacher there, um, and I don't take this lightly because Smith School is one of it's one of our most treasured assets in the city, and we have to be able to protect it. We have to protect the kids that are in it, but we also have to be realistic. More questions? I've got a couple more of your questions here, so I know they're not all answered. I'm gonna ask one of them. Oh, here you come, okay, good. Hi, I'm Andrea Egito. I um, live on Spring Street in Florence, and I teach at Ryan Road Elementary School. In the past couple of years, there's been talk in the city when the school budgets were struggling and having a difficult time. There was talk about closing an elementary school in the city of Northampton and um, bringing it down to three elementary schools, even though we've in the past had many more students than we do currently, and that number is continually fluctuating. and. Um, everybody knows that once you close an elementary school, it's really difficult to reopen it because of new uh, mandates and such of, for buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to know for both of you what your thought is about having four elementary schools in the city and would you support keeping that or do you feel like the city could survive on with three? wouldn't in a million years support the closing of an elementary school. During my override, let's call it displeasure or just debate, whatever, uh, and my opposition to it, I was a little upset that we had spent so much money in our public school system in the high school setting with third, fourth, and fifth year language classes, which are classes that are provided in the two community colleges that we have and Smith College at no cost to our Northampton Public School students. When we have lost aides and IEPs and things such as that in the elementary schools, where when a kid is in an elementary school, you need to identify whether or not this child has a problem. And if the child does have a problem, it can be handled at that level. Maybe we end up with so many kids that end up in special education classes that shouldn't have been there it was merely because when they came into the elementary school setting, we didn't have anybody to identify these problems. They just couldn't read. And we find out when they're in the fifth and sixth and seventh grade that they're learning disabilities because of their reading skills. So this is stuff that has to be identified. So I would, I would opt to move some of this money that we spend in these advanced mathematics and calculus and geometry, that stuff that is provided for at the community colleges in a college setting, like it's supposed to be, and pay attention to these kids that don't ordinarily do very well 
in academics. If a, if a kid is doing well in academics in high school, leave him alone because he's doing well in academics because he's going to do well in academics no matter where he goes. But there are kids that don't ordinarily do well in academics, and if they don't, they excel in things like art and music. That's where the creative thinking comes, and that should be a full-blown art and music classes and department in the elementary school level. That, that money needs to be spent on kids. You need to identify kids that might have a problem, whether it's reading. When my son went to kindergarten, he could read, but we saw to it as parents that he could read. So um, that's a huge discussion. We could. Uh, to address the question about Ryan Road, uh, the Ryan Road School specifically, I wouldn't support its closing. I think that uh, there's an incredible richness in having schools in our immediate neighborhoods, in kids getting to walk to their school. Um, it, I think it enriches the sense of community around a neighborhood when there's a school there and everybody gets to know each other through the school. Um, I think that we we should prior as a city we should prioritize keeping uh, those four schools operating um, there was another point I wanted to make I should have written it down um, I think I will stop there because it's gone out of my head might be a little out of order but this is me in 1989 this shirt no longer fits me and neither do the bridges yeah. but, uh, this was when I was fighting against the closing of the Lawrence Grammar School. Um, this was taken by the Gazette. I don't know uh, who, who took the picture. But elementary schools, neighborhood schools, gotta have them. I live at 11 Alamo Court in Florence. And I just wanted to, to speak about some observations. And um, previous administrations over the years have been what I would consider historically cheap patch. Do, do the best you can. We had to put in a new police station. We had to put up a new fire station. We're probably going to end up doing a new DPW. So as far as um, fiscal responsibility with the budget, how are you going to save any money? I mean, there, there wasn't any money spent over the years to maintain, to update. So now we're in a crisis. Now we're in a situation where things, the drainage system has to be replaced. At the same time this is going on, we've lost our dump, major source of income. I think we gained a cell tower on the dump property. Does this, is the city in control of a cell tower that we are getting revenue from? $2,000. It's something. All right, so I think trying to manage the bus budget through cost savings is not going to bring the city to where it really needs to go. They're going to have to look at bringing businesses in and somehow gener generating our own income whether it's the solar or whatever. So our business in our city, our downtown, is depending on people traveling. Well, everybody knows what gas prices are. So it's going to be affected. So anyway, um, I think it would be really beneficial to the politicians in this city if there was more transparency. And I think we really need to take a look at what's going on and get the people involved and tap the resources, whether it's Smith College, whether it's <laughs> Cole Morgan's no longer Cole Morgan. But I think we're all here, we're in it together, and it's time we all got together and really started brainstorming. Because, I mean, the last thing we've got going for us right now is our school system. It is one of the best, it is up there, and I please beg of you, do not mess with it, okay? We need it, and as far as benches go and homelessness, we have, a tr we have a homeless problem. 
I think a lot of cities do. We do a lot more for homeless than other people do. Removing the benches is not going to solve a homeless problem. It's bigger than that. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of. But anyway, because I heard about the benches and homeless people sleeping on them. I mean, with them, without them, we have a homeless problem. And those are my feelings. I would like you to comment them, but those are just observations I've seen from living here for the few years that I have. Thanks. I, um, I, I, I want to be able to, uh, I can't respond to everything in that uh, question, that, that comment, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about the um, question of transparency and the communication between city council, our city government, and uh, the citizens of Northampton. I feel really strongly that we need to figure out ways to, um, to have more dialogue. Uh, around all of the issues that this city is facing. That's why I'm committed to, and I, I did refer to this in my initial comments, to creating a kind of uh, town meeting style gatherings on a quarterly basis mm -hmm. so that um, I, as your city councilor, can really hear from you. We can have a discussion um, about what is of concern to you. So I can bring updates to you about what city council is considering and you can comment and weigh in. And that, I can, that way I can faithfully represent you um, as the, my constituents while I'm on city council. Um, I feel like that, that kind of responsiveness as a city councilor is so key to um, having a kind of transparency and, and uh, conversation with the people who are benefiting from city government. It needs to be a back and forth, and that's really important to me um, as I serve. Transparency, everybody knows where I stand all the time. Um, I'm very clear. Uh, Smith College, <clears throat> downtown Northampton, Main Street, State Street, South Street, Pulaski Park, whatever, every bit of that, every bit of downtown Northampton is as much a part of the Smith College campus as Smith College proper. They really don't pay any taxes. I was ecstatic when they were building their new parking garage on West Street and they said they were going to pay property tax. Perfect. So, of course, the Chapter 40 allows them not to if they don't want to. Yeah, especially if it has to do with education. So anyway, what they did, immediately after they built it, they leased two spaces out in the parking garage to professors at the college, therefore exempting it from property tax. They bought the Green Street and the West Street neighborhood. It paid $79,000 worth of taxes, property tax. They tore it down with the agreement that they would pay that money. Well, in the end of the agreement that was written and hammered out with our former mayor, it said, minus any other affordable housing that they construct. So anyway, they had three other pieces of property. They got the exemption on those three pieces of property, and it brought down their tax base that they paid for Green Street down to $2,400. So there's always ways around it when you, you try to go after this. You know, there are so many things that Smith College could do for us. The city of Northampton does its uh, public safety, fire protection, police, you name it, we do it for the college. And it is fighting like cats and dogs trying to get a penny out of them. They need to step up to the plate. We need to have real negotiations with him. I don't mean holler at him and yell at him and get nasty. I mean, sit down and say, look, this is what we have to do. We're dying here. We are, we are stopping. <laughs> we are. I saw the red sign and thought you were telling me the Red Sox were out. <laughs> okay. On the Red Sox note, it probably is time to be winding up so we can all go and figure out, did you, okay, I mean, I thought you gave me a little, okay. Um, so we can all go figure out what the beards are doing. So to wrap up, I need to thank some people 
So, and I bet you as soon as these two people start, uh, stop talking, you'll want to leave. So I'm going to get my thank you list. And of course, again, I want to thank all of you for coming and for asking questions. We've got closing statements. Don't run away. Don't run away. They're, still, they're, they're both going to tell you why you should vote for them. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank the, uh, the people who helped us set up this afternoon. I want to thank uh, Millie Rodriguez and her brother, Robert Rodriguez. I think Robert's still around somewhere to help close up. So thanks a lot. It really looks lovely. Um, it was very functional. I want to thank Northampton Cable Television, Al Williams, David Newland, Jennifer Ramsey. Be sure to check their website and find out when they're going to be broadcasting this. Um, they'll be doing some next week and for sure um, the week before the election. Remember to vote on November 5th. And I want to thank John Daniel for keeping everybody um, on schedule and making, waving, the, waving that little sign when necessary because when we get passionate about something, it's hard to stop in just a few minutes. So thanks, John, for keeping us all on track. And most of all, I want to thank the candidates for their really respectful observance of the ground rules we set out, really appreciate it was uh, no effort at all to moderate this because they were both, they know what they're doing and they're respectful of each other and you and I really thank you for doing that. So, uh, Jane is going to get the last word. We'll let you go first to wrap up and tell us why we should vote for you. As your city councilor in Ward 7, I will ask hard questions and challenge the city when necessary. But I'll also bring my experience as a policy analyst, as a strategic planner, as a trained mediator, and as a coalition builder to work with others to find solutions to problems and to get things done. I'll think about both the short-term and the long-term consequences of our approaches to problems, proposed ordinances, resolutions, and fiscal decisions. I won't just finger point and lay blame. I'll find the answers and implement solutions. I'll ask hard questions, but I won't be a lone wolf. I will work together with my fellow city councilors and city administrators to create solutions. Um, I ask you to uh, check my website, votealisa.com, to find out more about me. I would be honored to serve as uh, the Ward 7 City Councilor, and I won't let you down. Thank you. I'm going to read again. Uh, my family has been here longer than Smith College, and my love for this community and its people is why I stay here. Many will come and go, but I will always be here. It's where my heart is. I have a passion for my home, which is Northampton, a passion that has developed from a lifelong relationship with it. <clears throat> my purpose is to provide a voice that so many of my constituents here in Leeds and Florence can't articulate for one reason or another, and they turn to me, their counselor. Probably the biggest thing to come before this city is the stormwater project and my expertise as a drain layer and contractor will surely be an asset to the council as I will be able to ask questions that might possibly be missed. I have proven myself to be fiscally responsible without being overly conservative. I have paid attention to details and have gone to great lengths to see that what is before us is real. When I was told receipts reserved for appropriation for parking and ambulance could only be used for the entity from which they were derived, I said this was wrong. A former mayor, two department heads, a finance director, two city solicitors all told me I was wrong and I proved them that they were wrong. I spent days, countless phone conversations with the Department of Revenue and many emails. It all paid off for you. I came back with a letter that said those receipts could be used for any lawful municipal expense. And by the way, they amounted to almost $4 million. I could go on about my, my accomplishments, <clears throat> but Red Sox are playing in the World Series right now. It is common knowledge that I oppose the override and my opponent supported it. So in closing, I would like to say that my opponent is, in the Gazette, is quoted as saying that I think people that struggle financially 
are less part of the discussion of what our ward needs. I believe they should be more a part of the discussion of what our ward needs. And again, I will fight for everyone in this ward as I have for the last four years, and I would be honored by your support. For, by your support, thank you very much. Vote Gene Tacey for all of Ward 7 November 5th. And in, I want you to notice the absence of a website for me in flyers, because this is me, and this is what you get. There's no smoke, no frills, no political sound bites, uh, just real representation, asking tougher questions than have ever been asked in the council before. And I thank you very much for your support. I forgot to mention that you have another uh, another choice of rewatching this. What's what's your name? The North Street Association is here filming. Uh, they have cards on the back table. Pick one up, go to their website, and you can see it on YouTube tomorrow. Um, there are t-shirts from both the Leeds Association and the uh, Northampton Cable Television Station back on the table for you to buy. And there's a cup of apple cider, chat, visit, ask that question you didn't have a chance to answer, to get answered, and we will see you at Halloween. Go to see a ball game. Go to see a ball game.